Good afternoon, everyone. Hope you uh, all enjoyed a little bit of GNR on your Tuesday uh, afternoon. Of course, they are here later in the year. And obviously, the Foo Fighters have just announced they're coming as well. So great to have some international rock coming our way. Thanks for joining us today. We've got an action-packed uh, session. Now, I just want to quickly take you through the uh, supply chain report. All right, so I want to say a big thank you to those who participated. So this is the third quarterly report that we've completed. Um, we had 200 of you who gave us your time and information to be able to report on the current impact of uh, supply and also um, global construction, so the, the cost of materials. So firstly, I just want to quickly cover logistics and supply. So we referenced a uh, number of suppliers are experiencing uh, impacts in the supply chain. So you can see here that as of February, there was a slight decrease to 78% of suppliers who participated in the survey said they were experiencing supply issues. We just wanted to look at what were some of the key findings from this last quarter. And again, here is the chart from the survey, which you can obviously see in the report. The two key factors, delay the delays at New Zealand ports. So that is a key consideration and impact to decrease 17% in the last quarter. Uh, there's a reference around the uh, delays uh, de or decreasing in Tauranga. Hopefully most of you picked that in the question set, um, but certainly across the board, it seems to be um, flowing through the ports a lot easier now than we were just uh, pre-Christmas. And also a touch on the fact that local demand had actually dropped slightly, which was again of interest. Um, we touch on that in the report. Just thinking about what some of the issues could be around pricing. We saw that the number one impact um, on inflation in terms of the number of companies experiencing it was actually the increase in freight costs, followed by cost of materials. But when we actually looked at the actual inflationary pressure, uh, cost of materials was actually larger. So it's impacting fewer, but actually overall has a larger impact. Again, more of that covered uh, in the update. In general, the feedback told us that across the last 12 months, costs, your cost of materials had increased by 40%, and the prices at which you've been selling your product into the market had increased by 35%. So when we look across that period, we still see that there's some margin that has not been able to be passed on through to, uh, to your customers here in the local market. Uh, something we want to con uh, continue looking at um, over our subsequent reports, uh, next one, which we'll be conducting uh, in May. So in terms of the annual increases, let's actually just have a look at the structural category. So we can see here that we had a cost increase of 16%. Um, it was in the first six months. Um, and the last six months up until January 2022, a 24% increase across the board. So we look at the indexed increase from where we were January 2020 to uh, January 20, oh, sorry, January 2021 to January 22. We've got a 44% increase. And then we've uh, got that across the different categories that we recorded. Uh, so you can see structure had the largest increase, but to be honest, it's significant uh, across all categories. Uh, and then we've done the same in terms of uh, the sell prices into the New Zealand market. So again, we've got uh, the total for both six month periods and then the indexed price as well. Uh, we're actually releasing this through general media at the moment, and I suppose the main purpose is really to for um, the, um, the wider market thinking about how they're preparing for their construction projects and um, having this in mind, certainly in terms of their contingency planning. All right, and then quickly just looking ahead. Um, so when we look at the next six months, uh, on average, we see that uh, your cost of materials is increasing 11%, what the prediction comes from your, your estimates. And in fact, you're looking to pass all of that on to your customers. Again, let's look at structure. Structure was flat at 10% in terms of cost material increase and sell price. And the rest of the categories 
Uh, you can see here largest differential is in the finished categories, so thinking of paints, uh, tiles, and carpet, um, increasing costs of 12% and a cost through to your customers of 10%. Just want to finish on lead times. Um, so what we are seeing is that there's a wider spread. Um, so there actually seems to be good levels of um, current stock held in the market. You can see the one week um, stock levels and lead times, um, but we're starting to see this growth out. In this case, for our enclosure products, we've got some um, that are out at 24, 25 weeks on average for nine weeks there. That seems to have been stabilizing, um, but that's going to be impacted by um, some of the freight and logistics issues that, you know, that Zane's going to talk about over uh, the next six months, whether that will improve, stay the same or slightly decrease. We did do a, a full section on preparedness um, with COVID, um, obviously hitting with Omicron. I'm not covering that today, but again, that's fully covered in the report that you can download. Again, the link is in the chat line. With that in mind, um, I'm happy to take um, questions through the chat line at any point, but I'd like to bring in Zane. Zane, good, uh, good afternoon to you. Many of us will be familiar with you from the chat that we had uh, in October last year. Uh, Zane is, of course, the Managing Director of DHL Global Freight uh, here in New Zealand. So, Zane, really appreciate uh, your time again uh, in joining us to talk about some of the considerations and impacts of global freight and the construction industry supply chain. So, with that in mind, what's changed since we last caught up? <laughs> Well, look, uh, g'day, Matt, and hello, everybody. Um, what a great uh, choice of music to start the day off with. You've even got a few punters out there who loved a bit of Guns N' Roses, and I reckon the ticket sales could be pretty good. Uh, have you <laughs> have you got the locksmith there, Matt, to keep your keep him away from getting your tickets, or, or what's the reason for it? But anyway, no, they're just to make sure that my teenage boys aren't escaping through the windows, actually, in the middle right. of the night. So, um, yeah, no, no, he's um, he's doing a good job. He's he's working away in the background. Bless him. That's great. So where we were from last time, and it was a month or so back when we last caught up with the, with the team, and, and thanks for the invite back again, Matt. Um, so what have we got going on? Well, we've got something just to add fuel to the fire, unfortunately, with this Ukrainian scenario. And of course, um, probably one of the big things we see at the moment driving uh, both logistics and cost of logistics is now this, um, this Ukrainian war uh, with Russia. Um, and supplies around fuel and the rest of it being um, inhibited or potentially strangled. Um, so we're going to see a big shift uh, in terms of freight and freight rates around bunker. Uh, this is what the carriers uh, charge as a fuel premium or a premium on the fuel for running their vessels on their round trips. And uh, last night, just alone, we received notification that on pre-shipment um, trucking and road freight costs, there's a 15% diesel fuel surcharge now being applied to cover the global trucking environment. So not the great start news that everybody wanted to hear, I'm sure. However, we can cover that off a wee bit more because I think the Ukrainian uh, Russian or the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine will also have some other downstream effects on certain other industries, i.e. particular agriculture. Um, and we see already that some of, uh, some of the neighbouring countries are already stockpiling vital foods, whether it's wheats or flowers or, or some of these agricultural products, uh, in the event that if this thing turns into something nastier, bigger, wider, then they'll be holding um, these raw commodities to feed their own countries. So naturally, we will see um, probably a spike in the price of general commodities uh, in time start filtering through as well. So not good for mums, dads, and people at supermarkets. But let's talk a little bit about freight uh, on a global basis. Um, since we last spoke, we've certainly seen a, a slight change for the better in terms of our ability to secure capacity and bring freight down here. We haven't seen a significant change in the price of freight. And knowing that most of your members, your biggest sort of uh, origin or supply point is China. Yep. Um, uh, certainly from a capacity point of view, we're now seeing um, ad hoc and online bookable space a little bit better. In other words, we're securing better capacity. Uh, there are still bottlenecks. Uh, I think uh, the next uh, scenario that's going to impact China supply is um, the government's uh, clamp down on Novel Omicron, which is what they're calling it. 
Um, and we're sort of hearing noises that ports like uh, Shenzhen and Yantian um, may be um, shut or closed or, or have parts of it closed due to the risk of another outbreak. Uh, we're certainly seeing that there is a significant shortage of truckers, uh, particularly to take th um, items through from either um, southern China into Hong Kong and get them on vessels there. And that's simply Omicron driven. But um, as far as getting space is concerned, a little better. Pricing still similar. We don't see that dropping at this point in time. And I think I gave an indication that we're seeing prices ranging between sort of 8,000 US dollars a 40 foot container, right up to $14,000, depending on the type of service that you're selecting. Um, although on an upside, we are also seeing some of the shipping lines now wanting to talk longer term contract and fixed pricing. And they do that on a, um, on a TBR or a time volume um, uh, program. In other words, you're committing a certain amount of volume over a specific period of time at a committed rate and the carrier will hold you to using that volume. So they're essentially looking to give you a fixed price, which is great because at least you can budget and know what your fixed cost uh, may look like in terms of freight. Um, but there is a volume commitment that will go behind that uh, if you're getting, getting a fixed price for the year. That's a good thing. On the New Zealand side of things, uh, I saw the question in your uh, report. Ports of Auckland um, still experiencing five to six days turnaround from working a vessel. Uh, and, but we also have heard that they've got berthing challenges getting a vessel alongside. Uh, the port, and that could be anywhere between five up to 15 days. Um, once again, we've seen a couple of vessels, what we call in the trade, cut and run. So in order to try and keep their uh, integrity of their schedule, um, they can't afford to wait 10, 15 days at one port. So they cut the port out and they run to the next port. In this instance, it's been Northland or Northport. Uh, and that leaves, unfortunately, importers a little bit high and dry because then the cost to bring that freight back down is borne again by the importer. So we've seen that happen a couple of times in the last week or two. Uh, and the only other area that we see on the ports of Auckland is their automation program that I think we talked a little bit about last time, Matt, has yep. um, now been put on hold and we don't see that will be starting again until probably Q4. Um, I remember there was an issue to do with uh, getting experienced staff. That was one of the main reasons that that was delayed in the first place. Is that still the main cause? Uh, the staff have come through for operating the equipment and machinery down at the port, but I think there's just some bigger projects for them to get involved with at the moment, and that's trying okay. to sort out getting these vessels in and out quicker. Tauranga, however, is good, uh, really good. So if you've got your transport and your traffic that's coming into the country going through Tauranga, that's quite a good move. Um, um, been around time is a day, maybe two at the port in terms of working the vessel. Uh, there's not a lot of time for getting the uh, berth, two to three days. And um, the rail transfer up here is great. There is another upside for the import community looking at Tauranga is that um, unlike Auckland where your detention and port demurrage starts from the time that the container is unloaded from the vessel. Uh, if you're coming through Tauranga, your detention free time starts once it's arrived at the metro port. So that, uh, that's something rather advantageous for importers to think about. Um, we see the container depots in New Zealand are still pretty full. Um, so probably the biggest message for your members is, is um, act with speed to get your containers delivered and unpack them as quick as you can because it's taking upwards of um, 48 to 72 hours to off hire a container back to a depot from the time that you tell us it's available to off hire. So normally most shipping lines are giving seven days free detention time. So if you're not pulling the box out for um, two days after it's arrived and you use three days to get it, you might be experiencing some detention costs. We've certainly seen a, a fair raft of it pick up um, uh, from an industry point of view. So we we're advising our customers to turn your boxes around as quick as you possibly can. I would suggest that you would continue with a three to four week booking regime. In other words, if you've been forecasting and forecasting well, and you're knowing that your suppliers have got an extended lead time, the report I think cleared, covered that pretty clearly. Um, try to get your, uh, your bookings in early and, and take a global watch or a big watch. And here's the areas that I'd suggest that you watch. Um, the global watch on bunker and fuel prices. Um, whilst we saw some leniency come in yesterday from the NZ government, um, dropping 25 cents a litre of the fuel, I think that's gonna be really short lived. Um, because of just the, the pressures on the international market. New Zealand doesn't um, get um, significant fuel from Russia, 
um, but the pressure on other countries that do feed their fuel from Russia is simply going to put more pressure on where we get it from, and I think the price is going to continue to go up. From a construction and industry, Russia's had a big impact uh, with some of the sanctions that have been imposed around the steel trade. So now steel is becoming, and aluminium is, is um, uh, I won't say scarce, but certainly there's some pressure on those on that. And um, look, I think uh, last but not least, and we did mention it last time, if you're looking for a strategy going forward and you, you want constancy in your supply chain, um, you may want to chop some of your full container loads down into less than container loads. We're finding capacity of that nature for us to buy, uh, we call them LCL, less than container load boxes. We fill the whole thing, but with multiple customers' freight is much more consistent and we're getting regular lift each week from the likes of UK, Italy, USA, Belgium, Aussie, and so on and so forth, and China particularly. So just a couple of things there to think about. Overall, uh, the next six months, not a lot of change, unfortunately, team, relative to the ocean world, although a little bit of capacity freeing up, which is great. Um, costs will stay equivalent to where they are today. We don't see those dropping at this point in time. Um, and as I say, if you're interested in trying to fix your costs, talk to your provider because they may able, be able to do a uh, named account agreement with a carrier based on a time volume commitment. Hey, so Zane, so just a quick synopsis there. To date, we're seeing sort of capacity um, slightly ease, so, uh, and that's going to be a continued uh, occurrence you know, into the short term. Mm. There's going to be, um, and you're talking about costs being stable across that. So is capacity, there's talk about capacity easing towards the end of 22. Is that still something that um, you're seeing? Yes, definitely. There's quite a lot of new vessels that are being built, built for certain trades. So that'll see um, a, a lot more capacity come back on towards the end of the year and particularly into 2023, Matt. Yep, good yep. point. Great. Hey, so I just wanted to touch back on Ukraine. Alan's put a, um, a note in there how much freight is coming from Europe to New Zealand is coming through the Ukraine. Can we maybe just think about the, the supply chain that is impacted with uh, obviously the conflict and what is that meaning that Vessels or planes have been rerouted or delayed or cancelled as trips taking longer because they're having to fly around forbidden airspace. You know, uh, that, that Europe sort of logistics, any sort of general comment around how that's been impacted? Yeah, thanks, Matt. Good question. And thanks, team, for that. Um, OK, so we've definitely seen a no-fly zones introduced um, in Europe, particularly Russian airspace and Belarusian airspace. Um, what that... Uh, means for the carriers that are still operating is they have to circumnavigate around those traditional flying routes, uh, which means they take more fuel, potentially less passengers, but definitely less cargo uh, in order to meet their um, hub and spoke type commitments to and from their schedules. Uh, from a, a shipping point of view, um, not a lot of New Zealand traffic actually goes through the ports of like Odessa through the Ukraine. I know there is one vessel um, that loaded uh, up in Europe that's got a little bit of New Zealand cargo on it is stuck in the port of Odessa at the moment. But generally, um, um, freight will transfer to other European origins and uh, will book out of other gateways to come down here. Um, I don't personally see, or it's just my thoughts, that there would be significant infrastructural damage being imposed upon the port, or they wouldn't want to do that. Um, because it is a natural gateway for Russia to actually feed its petroleum exports out. Gotcha. So I, I think there'll be a little bit of sense, I hope there'll be a little bit of sense and sense prevailing. Great. Uh, question here from Chris, um, talking about uh, exports out of Long Beach. Um, what uh, do you see in terms of uh, uh, you know, timing for uh, exports from there? Okay, so thank you, Chris, was it that gave that question? Um, a great question, but not a good question, so I can say. Uh, USA is just a disaster still. Uh, upwards of two months delays uh, out of Long Beach for exports to get out. Uh, the vessel delays still remain a significant problem in, in the US trade. Um, uh, they had a peak of 109 ships sitting out um, West Coast ports in January, and that woohoo, has dropped to 76 uh, vessels in February, and it's going down. But the port infrastructure uh, on the West Coast of the USA is really heavily congested. Um, 
and they're, they're, they're really struggling to clear backlog cargo, whether it's inbound to the states or outbound. Um, they've got significant labour shortages due to COVID-related um, um, absences and the like, and um, the impact on the terminal operations is exacerbated simply because of lack of trucks and chassis to be able to haul containers to and from. So uh, a difficult market, the USA, probably of all of them, it would be the biggest issue market that we're seeing at the moment uh, in terms of timeliness of getting freight in and out of USA. Okay. Uh, thanks. Hope that um, that was helpful. Chris, Jeff's talking about, um, he said, notifications for an in increases for FAF of up to 25%. Is that reasonable? Firstly, what is FAF? Um, that's a fuel adjustment factor. Um, you might see it as an FSC or a, a, a fuel service charge. Um, our industry is fantastic at acronyms, Matt, so we'll yep. have 20 acronyms for the same thing. Sorry about that, Dean. But um, is, is, uh, all, all operators should be working to a, a mechanism, and that's based on a variation of the fuel pump price over a certain given point in time. Exactly the way the global um, fuel indicators work as far as working bunker for ships. Um, it's, uh, they adjust up or down if the price of crude or fuel or aviation fuel varies significantly over a two week period will trigger an increase or a decrease. Um, we've seen overnight, even though we had a lovely discount, um, our fuel surcharges from the cartage and trucking companies that we deal with double. So we were in a range of between seven up to 13%. We're now seeing an average of 17 to 18% applicable immediately. So your 25%, Jeff, sounds um, hefty. Um, I would suspect that if the fuel continues the way it's going, we may see a fuel surcharge up around that level though. Okay. Sorry, bad news, but hopefully that answers your question. Uh, Zane, why don't we just touch on air freight? Because we know an, uh, a number of manufacturers do use that for uh, either small components or for urgent supplies. So why don't we just um, start with painting a picture around the amount of uh, rapid antigen tests that you've flown in recently. Just want to give us a highlight of what's what's been happening over the last few weeks? <laughs> I can. Um, there's there's rat tests galore, team. So don't worry about supply. There's plenty of the New Zealand government. We understand is contracted to take roughly 100 to 120 million rat tests. Um, we've been involved in moving around about 30 million of those in the last um, three weeks gone and the next three weeks coming. Um, we've currently moved 14 charter aircraft from the likes of um, China, um, Korea, Australia, and there has been some European supplies come down as well. Um, the good thing about a lot of the rat test movements are they've been charter flights, so they've not interrupted um, other capacity that the general uh, market is looking to consume, which is um, good. And it's also assisted some of our primary exporters on getting some exports back out of the country um, when, when these planes come in full or they need a return load out, so that's helped a bit as well. Um, so rat tests are very, very, very prominent. Um, they'll be still coming through for the next four weeks and um, you will not have an issue um, um, getting them. I guess for the traveler, um, your eight or nine dollar rat tests turns into an $80 event if you need to get a certified um, test to go out of the country. Uh, I'm heading out in two weeks time and um, $80 is the cost to get a certified test going out. But you do need to be careful where you're going and check which country you're going to because some require PCR, some will accept rat testing. Yeah, is that, that 72 hours before you leave? Is that still right? Uh, Rat tests are 24 hours and okay. PCR tests are 48 hours. 48, okay, thank you. Um, general capacity is okay. It hasn't changed a heck of a lot. What we haven't seen is a huge uh, uptake yet on trans-Tasman volume. I think there's still a degree of um, anticipation by the Aussie community travel travellers and the New Zealand travelling community. Yes, there's certainly more passengers going across, but they're all narrow-bodied aircraft that are flying at the stage. We haven't seen the return to the big wide body aircraft that take the uh, significant container uh, volume that we need. Um, we still see Singapore Airlines, Qantas, uh, we have our own aircraft, um, uh, DHL Aviation flying. The capacity is okay. There are some backlogs in Australia coming in to New Zealand. The rest of the world is um, holding up okay. Um, we've seen a slight increase in cost out of China, and that's mainly to do with COVID restrictions at certain airports. 
um, delaying or lengthening the handling time to move freight through. So overall aviation is pretty sound uh, right now for what it is and how we're managing it. Um, there's still capacity available. Zane, so I just want to um, get into a bit of a summary here. Um, so it seems to be sort of definitely a sort of a, a stabilising um, of sorts in terms of capacity. There's some areas where we need to look out for some price increases. But back to sea freight, we've again, you're, you're sort of selling a picture where we've um, we've we've got some normality in the market, a, a new normal for at least. I'm thinking about the next six months. Have I got that right? Yeah, I think that's a very fair assessment, Matt. Um, look, there'll be pockets of up, down, or um, depending on the urgency, but by and large, there'll be a relative stabilising um, of, of the costs. And, and you've got to remember, that's stable at the new norm. So they're not what they were two and a half years ago. That's at today's rates. And you, I'm sure you're sitting there saying, bloody hell, that's expensive. Yes, it is. Um, but, but I don't expect to see um, the... 100%, 200% jumps that we started seeing 12, 14, 18 months ago um, yep. keep kicking in. They, should, they will stabilise. Yes, and you are right that um, just from our research, it seems that the Chinese ports are heavily utilised in terms of uh, directing materials into the New Zealand market. And so your point there is around just sort of their domestic trucking capacity. Yep. You said that there's been a decrease there due to sickness. And I suppose that's something we just need to be um, be mindful of is around you know uh, the capacity and these other and these international large um, manufacturing bases in terms of just getting getting product to the ships, which where uh, they can then come down here. So um, great to get your insights there. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks, Matt. Um, all right. So look, we'd, why don't we uh, leave that there? Zane, I just want to say thank you very much for your time and efforts. If anyone has got uh, any uh, questions or they'd like to learn more, um, we have Zane's contact details so you can uh, get in touch uh, with him if you'd like to discuss any of this in further detail. I wanted to just uh, see if there's any suggestions from you around what topics we could cover. We've obviously in the past, we've uh, had industry experts like Zane, we've interviewed key architects, uh, uh, we've had what QSs, we've had developers. An area of interest I thought we might want to touch on is um, things around our industry associations. So our, um, our sponsorship activities or how we actually engage with uh, industry associations. So that was an area I thought we could tackle, um, but I'd love to get your suggestions. Uh, so if there's anything that you, uh, an area that you'd like me to consider, um, for our um, session in a fortnight's time, please let me know and I can work on that over the next week or so. All right, so Zane, thanks again for your great expertise. Appreciate it. I've got a couple of comments in here that a few people arrived late. So for them, we're actually going to rock out with a little bit more of uh, GNR just to get everyone locked and loaded for the rest of their Tuesday afternoon. Zane, um, be safe. Um, happy travels overseas. Um, and look forward to catching up with you in the future. For everyone else, enjoy your Tuesday and uh, look out for the supply chain report if you haven't already um, browsed it. Cool. Thanks, Zane. Cheers, man. Here we go. Bye-bye.